I'm Reverend Shauna Hyde. I am the pastor of Parish Life at Christ Church United Methodist in Charleston, West Virginia. I'm a chaplain at the Victim Services Center, and I am the author of Victim No More. Well, the, the book is hard to describe, but basically it is set up for study, whether in, in a group or individual, it is set up for study. And we start first with self-defense 101. And I, and I correlate between physical self-defense and spiritual self-defense with the basic rules of self-defense. The things that we teach, whether it's a physical self-defense seminar or a church service, we teach people to be aware, to know where they're going, to let other people know where they are, these basic concepts. It's picking our attitude and how we're going to live life. Uh, victims get picked on more likely if they look like a victim and act like a victim. Then it's keeping our knees bent and remembering to have a life of prayer. It's, it's learning how to not be afraid of the fight, whether it's a physical fight or a spiritual one. Learning how to walk into that place and engage in that fight knowing that God has our back, literally. After much study, and there's lots of scripture verses to choose from, there's lots of uh, pretty nosy questions that are kind of pastoral care questions, I guess, good counseling questions. Hopefully, when you've done all of this, by the time you're at the end of the book, you've had an attitude change where you realize that you are enough, that God has created you as you for a reason, that the things that have happened in your life, while they may not have been good and they may have been very painful, have shaped who you are now so that you can better understand God and have a positive encounter with God and know that you have overcome what has happened to you or you will overcome what has happened to you or what will happen to you because ultimately God is in the fight with us and God does not just throw us in the ring and say see you later. I submitted a resolution to the United Methodist General Conference that well, is actually asking for an amendment to the Book of Discipline. <laughs> no small feat. And I noticed in our social principles that we have a paragraph that says that women have the right to seek safety and shelter and have the support of church and community when they've been abused or mistreated. But there was nothing that addressed it for men. And given the fact that domestic violence against men does happen, and we're not really sure what the statistics are because it tends to be more unreported than with women, I wanted us to have a paragraph that says the same thing for men so that somewhere churches can make this change and help men understand that this does happen, this can happen, that they can report it, and they have the same rights for safety, protection, and support that women have. Well, a lot of people want to know why I wrote this book and why I work at the Victim Services Center. And the long and the short answer is I had a very gentle father, still have a very gentle father, and I made the assumption that all men are that way and came to find out through experience that not all men are that way. And after finally getting out of a marriage that was very unhealthy, I started to question my faith, question God, and, and try to figure out where all of this stands because I wasn't supposed to be mistreated and I wasn't supposed to be divorced, but I found myself in that place. And somewhere along the lines, I started taking karate and I started to see the similarities and the correlation and started to explore reshaping who I am and learning to look at life differently, learning to look at faith differently, and coming to understand that God not only wants more for us, He expects more from us. And He gave us everything we needed to do that. This book first started as an Emmaus Walk talk. Um, it was the Sanctifying Grace talk. And 
it was so well received that someone said, you need to give that talk somewhere else. So I started to give it in other places. And then when I got to seminary, I saw more correlations as I studied more theological works and was writing these things in my papers. And the professors were saying, you need to compile this. You need to take this further. This, these are good thoughts. And then my grandmaster was telling me the same thing. He kept saying, you're seeing all of this connected and you need to let people see that connection. So then I, one day I sat down and wrote it all out because the lead pastor here, Randy Flanagan, said, your professors have been telling you this, sit down, write it out, and it can be a Bible study here. So it became a Bible study here in rough form. It was just paper and a three-ring binder with lots of edits that still needed to happen. But people liked it. And then I believe there was a young woman in the class who liked it, who took it home. And her husband liked it. And then the next thing I knew, I was submitting it to a publisher and being published. Being a chaplain at the Victim Services Center just means that I meet with victims of any sort of crime. So of course we get a lot of domestic violence victims that we work with and deal with and they see me if they have requested spiritual support and encouragement and many times they just want to know that God still loves them and that God is somewhere in the midst of this and try to find some sort of peace in the midst of all that's happening with them. Okay. Empowerment means helping someone be the best they can be. That's the way I see it. A variety of things can be used for that. It, you see it everywhere with any kind of teacher giving a music lesson or a math lesson or a parent instead of just criticizing a child will teach the child and get them to learn more than the lesson at hand. It is, and I totally forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> I travel around now and give this talk and present this book uh, quite often. I have been to women's retreats, to youth group meetings, I've been to men's prayer breakfasts, I've been to church services. Um, I even did one associated with the prison. Uh, I had to take out some of the karate stuff. Some of that was <laughs> deleted. But they wanted the how to change your attitude part. And now I travel around, I get several bookings a year to go and talk to just a variety of groups and inevitably there are the handful of women who come and talk to me in tears who either are in an abusive relationship or who are uh, recovering from having been in one. There's always the the mom that says would you please talk to my daughter? <laughs> I wish I had brought her. Would you write her a letter? Can I give her your phone number? There's always comments and many people just say thank you at the end of it because I don't think we're always good at reminding people that God does love you for who you are now. He does. But God also sees who you can become and God wants us to overcome everything, not just survive it. He wants us to be more than and to be better when we get to the end of our lives. The greatest tool of all to be used is to empower others with the constant and abundant application of grace. Empowerment means to help someone become the best they can be. The reason why that's empowering is you can offer them skills and education to become better, but you also know when to quit pushing. And there's a point where that becomes negative and you can undo all the work you just did. So a lot of empowerment is also accepting that someone really has given it all they have, done the best they can. And the reason why karate works with this so much is because each time you go for karate, you're not compared to the other guy. You're compared to how well you did the last time. So each time you're up for a test, they look at you 
and what you have done and how you have improved and what you are capable of, not what the other guy did. And that's why it can be so empowering. And then there's just the constant education and push to be more, to do better. You didn't get it right this time, you have next week. Come back and get it right next week. If you didn't get it right next week, you have the week after. And usually, if you didn't learn it from one teacher, you can always find another until you find the person who speaks your language, who breaks it down in such a way that it makes sense, and then suddenly one day you get it. So karate can be very empowering. Grace is something that very much has to be lived into. Um, one of the gifts that was given to me here is I had always been told that my name, Shauna, was Irish and meant running waters. But I found out that it's actually Hebrew and means God's gift of grace. So I started to really think about what it means to live into our names and into that gift of, of grace. Because grace is no small thing. And grace can be deliberate. It can also be accidental, where you don't realize that you've just given someone a second chance or a better idea. But grace is something that will always be the challenge of human existence because we always want someone to blame. We always want someone to, to pay the cost for something. We're always afraid we're not good enough to accept it. And we're always afraid to extend it because we might give the other person the upper hand. That's very much American culture, I think. So somehow we have to learn that we're being the best people we can be when we start to consistently offer grace. And that simply means to see someone for who they are now, we see the faults, we see the good things, and we love them in spite of it because we can also see who they can become and we know what they're capable of so we try to empower them and give them grace which simply means love them anyway don't judge be helpful try to teach and let people grow and then last, accept how far they get. 